Well, welcome, ladies. Happy Valentine's Day. Right? I mean, happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Chocolate, friends, right? John? I want to see. <laughs> so we like to celebrate our girlfriends, um, our sisters in Christ, on our special day of Galentine's because sometimes there's no other person that can celebrate a lady like another lady, right? I want to hear you. There's no other person that can celebrate a lady like another lady. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I'm really excited. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Misty Aspenberg, um, and I am Rich Aspenberg's wife, the pastor here at Mission Point Church. Um, and we invited John here to speak with us today because this year with Sela, we decided to um, kind of take us all on a journey of what it would look like if God generously restored us. Um, in all the different areas that he longs to and all the different areas that he promises to. And one of the areas that I think are probably the most important, other than our relationship with the Lord, is our relationship with other people. And I know that in this last season of isolation, um, if you're anything like me, it's been really stressful. I've been seeing some ugly come out of me. Um, and so, right? Um, but then also in our relationships, they just seem harder. They just seem harder. Um, and I really believe that God gives us a lot of tools and wisdoms in his word to handle it. But also, John has been a huge help for me personally, but also uh, me and Rich see him. We need to see you more often. <laughs> but we were seeing him once a week uh, for marriage counseling, not because there was anything really wrong, really, because we know that relationships are hard. Um, and in the role that we're in, it's busy, and we carry a lot, and we need to make sure that we put each other first. And so... Um, he's been helping us with that. But we call this in good company because we want you to know that you're in good company. Most likely, you're not the only one that is struggling with the things we're going to talk about. One thing I love about you, John, is that um, he does this thing where he'll say, can anybody relate? And they go, yep, yep, yep. And you feel this bond. You feel seen, right, when you're vulnerable. And so hopefully we'll get to do that just a little bit today as well. We have... Um, Five questions, many were submitted, but I wanted to give you guys um, some time to have an open Q&A here as well. So if there's any questions you guys want to talk about, um, things like that, we'll try to leave some time for that. But before we dive into all that, do you want to introduce yourself just a little bit? Okay. Um, I'm John Douglas. I am a, a licensed professional counselor in the area, um, married. I have three children, been married for 20 years, just celebrated my 20 year wedding anniversary, thank you, to an amazingly gracious, forgiving um, woman. And I have three children, um, two that are really, really good. And, um, <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> no, I like them all, I promise. Um, no, I have, I have uh, three children, ages 15, uh, 10 and 6, and um, yeah, so I, I love, I, I tell people I do marriage counseling, I, I, my heart and my passion is for marriage counseling, relationship counseling, um, but I also do a lot of addiction counseling and a lot of trauma, which really has, has led into the underlying issues, I think, in addiction oftentimes are relationships and trauma. And that has led me more away from a focus on addiction <clears throat> and a focus on relationships and trauma. Because I think when we really address those issues and the, a lot of times the shame and the underlying issues that go along with that, then we see the relief of a lot of those other issues. That's good. Um, we actually just had John come in for our marriage conference, and I have to say it was probably the best experience that I've had with our church, a group of people sharing so vulnerably, um, and how much we could relate to each other, and talking about shame was huge. It was really beautiful. So um, our first one is actually a marriage question. You ready? It's, it's a deep one. I can probably guess who, who wrote this. Ready or if not. If you're watching, because yeah. she's not here tonight. So number one, it says, what are some communicative tips that help a spouse share concern or frustration without their spouse feeling not good enough or defeated? You want me to keep going? It says, example, it feels like you've been drinking a lot lately. Emotion, I feel unsafe. This person's talking about themselves. Or I feel like I have no control because I'm observing my spouse without boundaries. Spouse's response, they shut down. They get frustrated 
at your concern or they feel like you are controlling their life? Question is, what are some communicative tips? <laughs> First help? of all, I got to compliment the person on the thoroughness of that question. That was, was the most thorough deep. question I've ever heard in my life. It even gives examples. She was going deep. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's not her first rodeo. <laughs> okay. So um, what I heard you say in that question is how do I, how do I tell my spouse that I don't like something that they're doing, Without you know, or something that they're them. doing is really bothering me or that I have a boundary issue and, you know, this is, a, this is an issue. Your behavior is an issue in our relationship without them saying you're controlling me or you're a problem or. Or, this. or shutting down. Or shutting down. Or not right. talking at all, yes. Well, so I guess my, my first reaction to that is you're not responsible nor are you powerful enough to control your spouse's reaction to whatever you say to them. That is, you know, I think a lot of the trouble I get into in relationship is when I try to contort myself into positions that um, I believe can, can impact the outcome and and so then we get into these issues where we, we muddy up communication and um, I think if I can just say I, oftentimes what's happening is that there's something going on inside of me and I have to look inside of myself to go what is going on here and usually especially in a situation like that it's because I am taking what is happening with my spouse personally and when I can detach myself from taking their behavior personally, then I can set the boundary in a way that is clear and not emotion laden, right? So here, if I'm trying to set, if I'm taking something personally, in other words, I'm thinking you're doing this to me, you're hurting me, you're, you're, um, you know, this is this is something that's to, done to me, then I will be. Um, I will have an emotional reaction to that. I'll be wounded, hurt, uh, all the rest of that. And if I can, when I try to set the boundary from a place of being wounded and hurt, it always comes out sideways. It always comes out in a way that is going to elicit a response from the person that is defensive, all the rest of that. But if I can, if I can detach myself from taking it personally and go, hey, your behavior is not okay. And if it continues, this is going to happen then I can set that clear boundary in a way with a person that is not emotional, not, not a, you know, and, it, and that's hard, right? It's really hard because it, the things they're doing are hurtful, and I get that. I get that the things that they're doing are hurtful. But when, if I, as much as I'm able to really recognize that that person's behavior is not about me, that frees me to love the person in their brokenness and their woundedness and address their behavior from that way. I don't know if that answered that question. Well, can you go back? You said muddled communication. Is that what you called it? You said muddled yeah, something. something. Like that. What do you mean by that? Is that when you your emotions get, or is it when you're trying to sugarcoat things or when you're trying to, when you're just not being clear? Yeah, all, all of that. When I'm mm -hmm. trying to control what the person when I'm trying to control the person's reaction yeah. to what I'm saying, then my communication isn't clear. All right. This is for all the singles out there. Let's okay. see if you can answer this. I got nothing. I've been question. married for 20 years. What can I tell you? No. Twofold <laughs> question. I know what you could tell <laughs> How do I be content being oh. single and... Do you think God makes it clear if he doesn't intend for you to be married? Yeah. <laughs> no. um, Better be right, John. So I think God wants me to be content, and then he makes things clear. I'm not sure that he makes it clear whether or not I'm supposed to be single or not supposed to be single. I, I think, so I was sharing with somebody the other day, and really, I, I was looking at my wife, actually, and I said to her, I think for the first time in my life, I might be content. And it's such an odd feeling that I wasn't sure of what it was. 
I said, um, you know, in my life, I've always been kind of restless, looking forward to the next thing, running forward to the next thing, wanting the next thing. And when I get to the next thing, then I'm going to be happy. You know, it's like, you know, I, I couldn't wait to get out of elementary school. And then, you know, middle school is going to be great. And then I couldn't wait to get into high school. High school is going to be, high school is terrible. Couldn't wait to get into college. College is going to be great. Can't wait to get a job. A job is going to be, wait, oh, man, I wish I could go back to elementary school, you know. And I think in my life, I couldn't, I just, I just struggle with contentment, you know. And I love the verse, godliness with contentment is great gain. And I think about that so much of the time, like, what enables me to be content? And I think what enables me to be content is learning to live and enjoy life in the moment for all that the moment has to offer. And I've been beating this into my brain and teaching this for years, so it took a long time for that to, like, settle in and actually play out in an emotion that I call contentment. But I had to, like learn over and over again just to enjoy today for what today has to offer because tomorrow's not guaranteed and yesterday doesn't exist. So when I live in today and I just enjoy all that today has, to, today is filled with so much enjoyment. You're single. Date. You have so much money. Maybe. You have no children, I'm, I'm guessing. Maybe you have children, <laughs> but you have so much money. You know, like I have no more money. It all goes to children, you know, and I don't have freedom, you know, like there's, I, I used to have this, this single friend and, uh, I, you know, he was like 40 something and I was 40, you know, and I, he would like riding all over the country, this guy gallivanting around the country in his yes. singlehood, you know, and I would look at his Facebook page and he'd be posting all over the place and I'd be like, man, that guy, I wish I was that guy, you know, and then one day he comes to me and he's like, man, I wish I was you, I wish I, I wish I had what you have and I go, Golly, you know, like I, I always want something else. It's a curse of life. I always want something else rather than just living and enjoying what I have right in front of me. You know, I, I have this little girl who's only going to be six for a very short period of time longer, and then she's not going to be six. And her hands are like that big. And I love them. And so I go, like when I feel discontent, I just go and I, I go in when she's sleeping and I'll just, I'll look at her little hands and I'll remember, like it wipes out all the terrible from the whole day, you know? <laughs> it's those little hands. I just enjoy what, what the moment has to offer, even, even the hard times. And, and I mean, I'm learning the secret is to enjoy the hard times because they have something. I'm enjoying the good times because there's something in that moment and and I think that's really the secret to happiness. I love how you stuck on the contentment. Because, yeah, I think you'd be married and discontent, children discontent, single discontent. Like, just discontent. Yeah. Yeah. All right, number three. Do you have any tips on having those conversations about parenting discipline styles? I'm guessing they're talking about with their spouse, right? On disciplining Anybody your spouse? Is that the question? No. Maybe I heard that how wrong. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to add to this. When you and your spouse have different disciplining styles, how do you communicate and how do you agree upon one? If I butchered yeah. your question, I'm sorry, and you'll get a chance afterwards. I like this question. So what I hear you say is that we disagree on something, you know, and that something in this instance is parenting styles. What I say to that is good. It's good to disagree. It's good to, to think differently in some of these things. When I embrace those differences, I don't want somebody that always agrees with me. If there were just two of me, it would be a really bad thing. You know, like when I really learned to embrace my wife's differences and realize, you know, she may be over here and I may be over here. And it used to be like we would pull against each other. You know, it felt like a marriage felt like this tug of war where it's like, I, I'm right, I'm right. I mean, we're supposed to do it this way. I think this way. And then she'd be like, no, I'm right. And the more I pulled this way, it was like it, it just got further and further apart. When, and, and all of that changed when I started to go, I need more of what she has. Not that everything she has is 100% right. I have good stuff too. And she needs some of what I have. So, like, I want to come together and go, you know, maybe the way that you parent is not 100% right, and the way that I would want to parent isn't 100% right. That's why God gave them both parents in this instance. And so how do we come together and, and meet in the middle on that parenting style? I think that's a beautiful thing if you're, if you're 
very different. Do you have any tips on how to do that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nothing? No, I mean, <clears throat> go to the, when I go to the person, usually when I'm willing to move towards her, she moves towards me. Can you give us an example of what that looks like? Would you just like, I'm trying, I'm trying to get it for myself too, listen. <laughs> <laughs> so is it like, okay, so Rich and I have two girls and a boy, and I'm very overprotective of my boy, and he's always like, let him do it, let him do it, but I'm like, he's going to break his neck. Do I just kind of back off and let him break his neck? Like, what's giving in a little bit, just having a conversation and compromising back and forth? Yeah, it's interesting. So I can relate to that a lot because my, I'm the break his neck side. Yeah. You know, I'm wondering um, if most men are. Probably. I want to get him a four wheeler, and she's like, no. But I mean, um, but we, you know, the thing is, it's interesting, right? So I'll give you a different example. Finances, right? So my wife, my wife was always like, she's the cheap one, and I'm the 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 spendy. One. I don't know they, how to say that, something different. I'm the spender. She's the cheap one. So, man, that sounds derogatory, too. She's thrifty. Thank you. She's thrifty. Shoo. Hey, she's a saver. Thank you. Got her. She's a saver. Thank you. But, you know, it's funny. Like, so, and my wife, it used to be this battle early on in the relationship where it was like, you're a spender, you're a spender, you're responsible, you're responsible. And she would you know, I'd be like, you're cheap, and you don't want us to have any fun. And it would just be like this battle, and it was like, you know, as, as, as she's moved this way to be, you know, she's loosened up, a weird thing has happened in that I became thrifty. Like, I'm, she, used to, she used to call me, and like be, she would be on the, uh, the app, like TD Bank app, you know, like, where are you at? What did you just spend? What did you spend $5 at Wawa, you know? <laughs> And uh, it's weird because, like, today she doesn't even check the account. She has no idea what we have in our account. And I'm like, what'd you spend it, Wawa? You know, <laughs> I see you at Kohl's, lady. You know, and it's weird. It's a weird thing that happened, you know, as we, like, have moved towards each other. And I, I don't know. We've almost changed roles in that one. Thank you. Uh, number four. I like this one, too. Um, it says, how do you keep distance or hold boundaries with family members or friends mm. that are not good for your mental health? Mm. I hear a lot of whispering. We got a lot of those people in here. Who created these questions? Oh, my goodness. How do we set boundaries with family members that are not or good friends. for your mental health? Yeah. <laughs> what family member is good for your mental health is my first question. <laughs> I got nothing but family members that are bad for my mental health. Um, I don't know. First of all, again, I, I mean, people, are, you know, we probably already know this, but it, it's I can do nothing but say positive things about my wife's family members. And in the beginning of the relationship, I think I didn't really understand this. And it took me a long time to, to just really, you know, each of us has a hard enough time with our own family members. I don't really know the, I'd have to know, like, there's a lot more backstory. If somebody wants to stand up and explain that question, I would answer it better. But this is going to be the best I can do with what I got. But, um, when I learned to just love and encourage her family members and accept them, then I became a support for my wife dealing with difficult family members. And I wanted to kind of back her up and be on her side. And that's kind of with everything in relationship is when I have moved over to try to like take her side and support her in that and, you know, even, in, for instance, if she's bashing her family members, and we have super challenging in-laws, but um, it would, it, when I try to move over and just encourage her and help her to love her family members and help her to, you know, love them and to set boundaries with them and to, you know, but in, I would rather empower my spouse by encouraging her to set those, you know, how do I, how do I empower her to set those boundaries herself rather than say, you need to set boundaries, you know, and then I'm kind of looking at what she is or isn't doing, um, 
rather than just encouraging her to love her love her family love them and then how do you know do you think that we should set boundaries with them and what does that look like and asking the right question I don't know if that answered that question at all but well since you said that you specialize in addiction as well so say that we lived a former life beforehand and now we are trying to make better decisions and things like that but still have those same toxic relationships around what would you say on how to create boundaries with those things And their family members in this scenario? No, I'm thinking, because I put friends in there too, because we all know we have people uh, in our life that we were once very close to that it started becoming toxic. And so how do we lovingly move away in a healthier space, whatever that looks like? Yeah, so, again, I think my answer would be to this, that I want to work on being as close as I can to my spouse, drawing near to my spouse in that. And when I build this relationship, mm -hmm. so especially in like families and friendships and everything that, when my relationship with God is good, mm -hmm. when I work on building my relationship with God, and then me personally, and yeah. I'm doing, you know, I'm close there, and I'm doing, you know. And then I work on building my relationship with my spouse, and I make sure that's good. And then I work on building my relationship with my kids. You know, it, like, flows down. And I, I say to people, you know, we focus on correcting these issues. And I think a lot of times in our lives, we end up playing whack-a-mole, you know, with issues. And with this one pop up over here. This one, you know, bang, it pops up there. And I think instead of my life is like looking at how do I deal with these things in my life to be that any hindrances or barriers in my life to being close and walking with God and then walk, being close and walking with my spouse. And then I think when, when that's good, those other things just kind of tend to fall out. All right, let's go to number five. This one's a good one, too. How do I get my husband to help out more without nagging? The magic answer is coming, ladies. Oh, my God. You know, I was hoping you were going to skip this question. Sorry. <laughs> How do I get my husband to help out without nagging? Um, it's a good question. I think... So it goes back to the muddy communication question, and I think it, it, it becomes like this, nagging becomes like, so much of the time communication is focused on what the other person isn't doing, and then it's related through this disappointment, and it's related through all of this, you know, I'm disappointed, I'm frustrated, you're letting me down, you're letting me down, you're letting me, why can't you get this right, you're letting me down, would you please just do this, would you please just do this, you're just disappointing me, you're disappointing me, you're disappointing me. And then I know as a husband, that can be really discouraging to me. And I'll tell you a secret is that I used to have this business partner, and he would say to somebody, he'd say, watch, I can get John to do anything just using positive words of affirmation. He would say that in front of me, and then he'd be like, you're the best. Would you go get that for me? And I would go get it for him. We can always get more flies with honey, you know. We can always get more. I, I, I thrive off of words, positive words of affirmation. And I think, like, so much of the time when, when that is, you know, when, <laughs> one, just clear communication without the disappointment around, this is what I need. Can you give this to me or can't you give it to me? And if you can't or you're unwilling to, then I have to decide what I'm going to do with that information. And positive words of affirmation. All right, this is our last one before we open it up. Um, any advice for someone whose partner is on social media too much when they are with you? Yep. Um, well, first of all, I'm probably the person. Did my wife write that question? Maybe. <laughs> um, 
Yeah. Oh, good. So I wanted to tie this question in with the last question. I think a lot of times we see problems and we notice a problem and we focus on the problem and then we allow that problem to bother us, right? So we're focused on the problem and then when we go to the other person, we're just kind of stating the problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. This is a problem. And it's not really solution focused. It's not really proposing a solution. So I wonder if instead the clear boundary would be what I want and what, that, what exactly that looks like and what's going to happen if you aren't willing to give it to me, you know, if you're not willing to. So listen, I would like a solution and a clear solution. So here is a basket at the front of the house. I would really, really appreciate it if we could put our phones away for an hour when you come home and just be present with each other. And again, so here's the other part, is I need to state my want because I want to spend time with you. And I want to be close to you. And I want to connect to you. And when you're on your phone, I feel like we don't get to do that. Would you be willing to give that to me? And then the other person can say yes or no. And what if they say no? They're not willing to do it. And then I have to decide what I'm going to do from there. Would you suggest they do? <laughs> it depends on the situation. It depends All on the right. situation. So if it's a, you know, if it's a phone situation, are you going to, you know, are you really going to, um, I don't know. It depends on how you want to set your boundary and how firm you want to set your boundary and how, um, yeah, that is, you have to decide how clear do I want to set my boundary at that point. You know, if the, if the person is um, doing a behavior that's harmful to you, that, that boundary is clear. We're not going to be in relationship with each other. We're not going to be, you know, you're, that needs to be a real clear, real firm, pressed back boundary. But if it's a boundary of a behavior that I don't like, then it's really not my boundary so much as it's a behavior that I'm communicating that I don't like and I would like for you to stop. And you either are willing to give it to me or you're not willing to give it to me. And if you're not willing to give it to me, then it's clear that you don't really care about being in relationship with us and I have to decide how to proceed accordingly. All right, now it's your turn. We have left some time that you guys can ask some questions. I can come around with the mic. That way we are recording this so you guys can go back to it or anybody can watch. Um, so do any of you guys have some questions? Maybe on ones that we already had or ones that you have now? Don't be shy. Yes, here, I'll come right to you. Um, what steps would you suggest to start taking to help rebuild trust in a relationship after your partner may have broken that? So, man, you guys are not giving me any softballs tonight. What the heck is going on? Here, are all boundary questions tonight, aren't we? All right, we're going there. Um, So the thing that I hear in that question is what do I need to tell my spouse that they need to do to re-earn my trust, right? And if I'm being honest, I think it's the wrong question because rea reality is your spouse violated your trust, right, in that situation he or she needs to come up with what they're going to do in order to regain your trust. And they need to have a plan and they need to work that plan. And if they're not willing to work that plan, then they're not willing to take steps to rebuild trust. You know? Um, again, so in my relationship, 
you know, it's so humbling to sit here with you guys because I'm always reminded of the fact of my failures in relationship is a lot of the reason why I'm sitting up here tonight. In my relationship, I am the, I, I was the addict, I was the adulterer, I was the one that broke trust in every way possible. And um, when we came in, and I came in, and, and I had a repentant heart, and I was ready to restore the relationship, my wife didn't give me a list of the things I needed to do to rebuild trust. I came to her and I said, I messed up. This is what I'm going to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again. And this is what I'm going to, this is what I'm going to do to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So whatever she would have asked for, I went higher than that. You know, so I wanted to be ridiculously like over the top with it. And, and, I, and I would put that back because you trying to tell your spouse what they need to do to re-earn your trust feels controlling to me. And it doesn't feel like it's going to be good for either one of you. It's like you, and it, it puts you in this position where you're like the mom and they're the little defiant boy. And it's no good. It's not good. I would put it right back to him. You're the man. You decide what you're going to do to earn my trust. You tell me. You come up with a plan and you come pitch it to me what you're going to do to earn that trust and help me to feel secure in this relationship. I wouldn't be the one put in that position where I'm defining a list of do's and don'ts that you want in that relationship. It doesn't feel good for me. It doesn't feel good for them. It's not going to, it's not going to be good for you. And, and I think that's totally fair for you to say, I want you to come up with what you're going to do. The other, the other, so that's the one side. The other side of that is this. Sometimes, even today, after years, after years, my wife will still say to me, how do I know that I can trust you? And I want to be like, are you kidding me? I'm a therapist, you know? Doesn't matter. What she's really saying is, I want to feel secure. I want to feel safe. And I'm scared that, you know, something's going to happen. And what I always say to her in those moments is, don't trust me, trust God. That no matter what happens with me, because the reality is, I could go crazy tomorrow and be gone. And her big fear is that I'll empty the bank accounts and run off with all the money. I don't believe that's going to happen, but it's act I have no idea what could happen, so I don't want to reassure her of something. I could die tomorrow. I could, anything could happen. And I, and I say, or put your faith in God, trust God that no matter what happens, you're going to be okay and plan accordingly. Good. Any other questions? Hi. Um, so this is like, hmm, this is hard. A little, little backstory, a little bit. So my parents are marriage counselors. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, uh, I think it's just an element of like, I, I'm so grateful for the example that they set. They have such a beautiful marriage, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, but I feel like the bar has been set pretty high, <laughs> like for me and, and for my, uh, my siblings, and just like, you know, just like Christian couple, like both in ministry, marriage counselors, t 25 years of marriage, both remained abstinent until marriage. Um, they're just that, that couple, you know, that, um, and I'm so, again, I'm so, so grateful for that example that I grew up in that home. Um, but there are times where I have to kind of, and they don't put any pressure on me, but I feel that pressure, you know, and I've had conversations with my younger siblings and them feeling that pressure as they're kind of entering adulthood now. Um, and just guidance on like how to not feel like that's like a mantle that I have to like, you know, it's, and it's, it's difficult in a way that I didn't expect. Thank you for that Thank question. You. I'm curious 
how much did it mess you up having parents that were marriage counselors? <laughs> I'm always, anytime I meet somebody who's the kid of a therapist, I'm like, how messed up were you? I want to know. I want to know how messed up my kids are going to be, how much I need to save for therapy, you know? So um, I think, like, I think I hear your question is, I feel a lot of pressure and I feel a lot of weight. It's interesting. I, I feel that as a counselor, and I imagine your parents feel that, and you could probably, if you ask them this question, they would probably say, you know, I feel that way. Like, I have to get it all right, and I have to have this perfect marriage, and if I don't have this perfect marriage, somehow I'm failing as a Christian, a husband, and a therapist, you know? And it's it's such a load of, you know, it's just a load. It's not true, man. Like, the, in fact, you know, like his strength is made perfect in my weakness. You know, it's, it, failures are what we learn through or what we grow through. The thing I would tell you is fail a lot and fail big and fail greatly. You know, not, hopefully not in the areas of sin, but definitely in all these other areas because of the fact that my failures are what is most used by God. They're most used by God today. And... um he rarely uses the things that I'm that I think that I'm, you know, good at. But um, I feel that weight of I have to get this all right, and I have to have a perfect marriage, and I constantly come back to that place where it's such that's such a lie from the enemy that I have to have it, anything close to perfect in that. It's only through failure that I grow, that I learn. Did I answer your question? Okay. All right. Do we have one over here? All right. Hopefully this is a quick one. Um, how do you friend zone men without friend zoning all men? <laughs> wow. <laughs> what does that look like? How do you friend, uh, just for those of you who didn't hear that question, Oh man, that breaks my heart. For as a man who was friend zoned, that question breaks my heart. I want to say, don't friend zone men. You know, <laughs> she said, "How do you friend zone men without friend zoning all men?" That that was the question. What's wrong with a friend? I don't. <laughs> what What's the matter with a friend? No matter with dating a friend. I think dating a friend's a good thing. No. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think you might be surprised. Uh, I don't want to close my mind or my heart to anything that God might have for me. So I don't know if that answers that question at all. But how do you friend zone a man? Just tell him you're not interested. I'm not interested. Thank you. <laughs> I don't like you like that, dude. I don't know. I have no better answer to that question. <laughs> see, no, I did that, and then I ended up marrying yeah, somebody I friend zoned. There so you go. Be really careful with that one. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I didn't have a better in. answer. All right, do I got anybody over here? Was that almost a hand? No, really? All right. Uh, all right. I'm going to build off that boundary question. So, but I'm going to go with more of a friend thing. So you and your partner have decided to live a more godly life and, and not reinvent yourself, go back to your basics. But the friends that you've been hanging around with um, are very ungodly and do ungodly things. So we don't want, we call them our family, but we need to set boundaries with our family. How do you do that without losing your family? Uh, okay. So I think this, it's always better, it's always easier to do, when you do do the do do, you don't don't the don't don't, okay? So when you, when you like, it's always easier to do than it is to not do, okay? So this is the, the illustration I use is this. You ever go to the beach and you scoop a hole in the sand. Well, if you don't do anything, very quickly that sand floods back into that space. 
if you scoop a hole in the sand and you put something else in it, then that sand doesn't go back in. So I think rather than focusing on avoiding the people, places, and things that were a problem or setting the boundaries with the people, places, and things that were a problem, it's, it, it, to me, it, it's better to put in new people, places, and things. So I say this all the time when I am speaking to people in addiction is rather than just getting rid of the people, places, and things, put in some new people, places, and things. And other, otherwise, the other old people, places, and things just flood right back in. And then I clearly communicate to those other people that I'm not that person anymore and I'm not living that life anymore. And if you want to hang with me, this is where I'm going. Come to church. <laughs> All right. Do we have any more over here? So my husband is an overindulger in a lot of things, and I, I was always fine with it, but now it's really affecting his health. Um, I know that I can't control it. Um, I've tried to encourage different things, but it's not really helping. Um, and now it's affecting his mental health and his overall health. Do you have any advice to guiding him without controlling or uh, putting him down? Yeah, so these questions are it's interesting. This is our theme for this evening. Like, how do we set boundaries and how do we communicate in love when we don't like that person's behavior without nagging about their behavior? And so I hear that on a lot of your hearts, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So two things, I think. One is that just kind of like the question I just answered over there, right? When I'm focused on what I get, so I find myself getting so focused on what the other person is or isn't doing. And then, especially when it's my spouse, my natural inclination is to look at what they are or aren't doing. And then I'm frustrated, discontent, resentful, all the rest of these things, and even just discouraged and fearful and all the rest. And really, like, if I can just focus on myself, I am a full-time job for John today. You know, I, I, I was saying this. I have not yet gotten the plank out of my eye enough to really look at the speck in my wife's eye. And, and when I am running after health, when I am running after God, I, I used to, especially, I got, I got clean. This is very hypocritical. I'm going to tell you that before I share this story with you. So I got very clean. I got clean, and I got an early on in recovery I was running after God, man. I was passionate about God, and I was, you know, on fire for the Lord. And I started to look at my wife and, and judge her relationship with God. Yeah, I know. Ooh. And, I, and I'd say, man, I wish my wife was more on fire for God like I am. You know, here, this woman's been good through every, like, she is a good, she's a good girl. And I am, you know, judging her relationship with God. And I'm like, I wish she was, I would, I'd start to, like, feel this feeling. I wish she was, like, a, a, a partner for me. I have all these desires and visions to do big things for God. I wish she, she's just not a partner for me in that. And I'd be like, and man, God convicted me of that to go, John, just run after me. You know, and just run after me and let me take care of her. I'll take care of her. I'll bring conviction. So I, I started running after God. And, you know, it's crazy. Like somebody, somebody said they were at a Bible study, you know, that my wife led. And my wife, it always tickles me when my wife leads because my wife, like, leads. Her. That is so outside of her comfort zone. She would never want to do that. But God, God did that work on her. And I can trust him to do that when I just focus on, here am I, Lord, change me. And then the other second part of that is, again, positive words of affirmation. You look really good. Did you work out today? <laughs> no? You should. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's like you look good. I don't know. I don't know. But I think there is some, there is some like, room in that for, like, building them up and saying, you know, I, I really... I'm telling you, you can get a lot done with positive words of affirmation. All right, did you have one? 
Hi. So I have a question about my teenage boys. I, um, it's, it's kind of like an addiction kind of a question. So COVID has uh, really hampered a lot of the um, extracurricular stuff. My son um, struggles a lot with depression on and off. So it's been a really, really tough two years. Um, at times has been uh, suicidal. So we've been really struggling with um, helping him. Um, <coughs> so he uh, finds a lot of comfort in, um, sorry. Welcome. <coughs> Finds a lot of comfort in uh, video stuff. You know, he's a lot, a lot online a lot. So um, my concern is, um, you know, we know, that we know the devil likes to strike in isolation. And that's kind of where his comfort zone is because he's safe. And um, I'm trying to find avenues to get him out of that uh, addiction of being online all the time. And he's not doing inappropriate stuff. He's just kind of on YouTube and things that are not. Uh, malice to him, but nonetheless, still isolation. Uh, so as a mom, I'm trying to not, he's 18, uh, and I'm trying to not helicopter him. Uh, I'm trying not to micromanage his life, because he needs to make his own decisions. So as, from, from an addiction perspective, my concern is um, really trying to help him not turn to that as a safety zone without, again, making him feel less of, of a person because he already has that on his own. So I'm trying to um, empower him otherwise. So first of all, I mean, I hear your struggle and thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm sure that's challenging and hard. I'm not sure what you were asking in that. What is, can you tell me what the question would be? Like, how do I do that? How do I? I'm trying to ascertain whether or not it's an addiction issue. I'm trying to make sure that if I recognize his pattern of repetitive behavior out of fear or out of anything else, trying to help him to find avenues with boundaries, I guess. It's kind of, I'm trying to help him solve his own boundaries kind of thing. Um, but because you're in, in addiction, and I'm a nurse practitioner, so I see a lot of addiction around me. So I, I, I know how to recognize, which is why we got into the whole suicidal discussion. Um, but I want to know from how to talk to someone younger and, and guide them to a healthier behavior without causing them to feel less of a person. Okay. So... Um one of my favorite talks is a TED talk. The guy says in the talk, uh, the opposite of addiction is connection. And man, I, I really believe that. I really believe that the opposite of addiction is connection. The opposite of addiction, and listen, we have to set boundaries with people in our life. We need to. And I'm going to share something on boundaries in just a second because it, it took me a long time to understand boundaries. But um, What I would want to know with that person is what are the barriers to connection? What, what, what's hindering you from connection? And I would want to create a space that that person was safe to speak into to begin to find out what, what, is, what is missing? What, what is keeping you from connection? Because that isolation... And that loneliness is is painful, and I'm sure that they, you know, he's stuck and lost in that connect in, in that that space. So how do I love him and help him to move out from that and say that I want to connect with you, and create the space for them to connect to in? Um, the other thing, real quick, on boundaries, I I think a lot of times we get confused on boundaries, and. So I, I think of boundaries like this. I think of boundaries like an old Western movie where uh, a horse, you know, cowboy's riding into town on a horse, and as he comes to the town, it says, you know, no guns, no, you know, chew, no um, 
crude language and no girls that do, you know? And um, I think, like, those are the town rules, right? So they're the town rules for that town. But as soon as you leave that town, you can shoot them up, chew, whatever, curse, whatever you want to do. You just can't do it in this town. And I think each of us, each of us are like a town, okay? It's like we're one of those western towns. And this is how I think of boundaries. I think of them as my town rules. So if you want to be in my town, then you need to comply with my town rules. If you don't want to be in my town, I'm not going to take that personally. There's the, you know, that those, you can go anywhere you want and, and do whatever you want. But in my town, you're not going to do, you're not going to do this. These are the rules. And my children, especially, they have no choice but to live in my town. <laughs> you know, but once they get to a certain age, then they, they need to comply with my town rules or they can leave my town. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get upset or take that personally, but it's, that, that's what I think of as a boundary. Does that make sense? All right, we have time for one more. Anybody else? All right. Oh, we got one more. Thanks, Amber. All right, so this is work-related. Um, so I supervise a home visiting program and a lot of times we go out and so we work with families that, you know, struggle with addiction or, you know, things to that nature or have, you know, difficulties in, you know, raising their children, things to that nature. How do you set, let's just keep talking about boundaries. How do you set those boundaries where you're walking in and of course, you know, in companies now and agencies now, you really can't bring the Lord into it. So we call it accentuating the positive. So we, we try to do that a lot of times, but then, you know, it's kind of like, here's the water, I've led you to it, but you're not drinking it. So what would you say for things like, you know, those situations where you're walking in and, or even in any, any situation, not just mine particularly, but how do you continue to try to help someone that doesn't want to help themselves? So my initial reaction to that is I want to love the person where they're at, love and accept the person where they're at, and then be Jesus to the person where they're at. And then until the, it's so obvious that it's something different than anything they're receiving anywhere else that they ask me, what the heck is different about you? And I go, oh, it's Jesus. And in, I don't, no matter what setting you're in, you can say that. When they ask that, I can say it's, you know, it's Jesus. I, well, I'm a Christian. I mean, whatever it is. And um, I'm not proselytizing or, you know, trying to convert them. I'm just telling them what's different about me. And I think, like, one of my favorite stories in the Bible is a blind man who goes, you know, I was blind and now I see. That's all I know. All I know is I was blind, now I see. And um, I think it's way more powerful for me to just love people who are expecting me to reject them and then to continue to love them even when they do something that is worthy of rejection. Because I think... I think most of us, really, if we're being honest, are expecting rejection. We're expecting to be rejected. And for many of us, the, the question in our heart is, am I worthy? Or the belief is that I'm not worthy of love. And so for someone to continue to love us when we expect to get rejected, and I think people do odd behaviors to see if, you know, if I push you, will you reject me? Are you going to love me? And... Um, I imagine you know this and see this all the time. But when I continue to love them, I find that that has gone more to than anything else I could do is just love the person where they're at. Does that answer your question? Man, I'm getting a lot of kind ofs tonight, and I think there's a lot of answers. These questions are hard. No, 
The, the thing about this, I want to say this real quick. The reality is this. Each of these boundary questions that you guys are asking, which are great questions, are super hard, super complex questions. They're like, they're like really good questions to ask. They're very specific, and it's hard for me to broad brush give you an answer to them. I wish I could answer all of your questions, especially with regards to boundaries, but I think that they are, they're tough questions that require like, let's talk them out. What I encourage, what did you notice tonight? What did you notice? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, so me reflecting that to you, yeah. What did you notice about the questions that we asked here tonight? Anybody? What? Common theme. What does that mean? You all have, a lot of you have the same questions, which means a lot of you have the same issues that you're working on. Man, talk to each other. Let's get some dialogue going on. You guys to say, this is hard. How did you deal with this? How did, you know, this is hard. These are hard issues. These are hard things. I mean, you got the rest of the night. All night. All night. Yeah, no, they were really good. John, thank you. Thank you for always being willing to come out and share with us.